Are you looking to get into ham radio? Are you coming from a similar background like myself, non-technical, no exposure whatsoever to ham radio before, and finding it difficult to try to understand? Are you looking for someone to explain it to you in a more simple, non-technical format and cover all of the basics of it? If that's what you're looking for, then you found the right place. This is a four-part series on the basic introduction to ham radio. Today, we'll be doing part one, covering the UHF, VHF bands. So, let's get started. Hey, this is MJ, call sign KO4TWA, and welcome to Ham Radio Made Simple. This is part one in the introductions to the basics of ham radio, and I'll be covering the UHF, VHF bands. Now, I broke this into a four-part series with parts one and two directed to those who are getting their technician's license and will have access to the UHF, VHF bands. Parts three and four will be directed to those who are getting their general license. And again, the focus will be on the HF or your high frequency bands. So today is part one, let's get started. So what are the topics that we are gonna go over today? Well, ham radio receiving only, UHF and VHF bands versus HF bands, licensing and privileges based on what you'll have legal access to transmit on, principles of wavelength and frequency, and I'll actually show you some images of that. What equipment do you need to get going? And there's many options. And what is a repeater and why should you care? I don't know about you, but when I began my journey into ham radio, I was hit with information overload. Whether I read articles or looked at YouTube videos, there were so many terms and acronyms thrown about, I really didn't have any clue what they meant or what they were relevant to. My goal is to put a compass in your hand and to take the multiple pieces of the puzzle of information that is out there and put it in such a way that it's going to make sense to you. I'll start with the four corners, I'll do the sidewalls, and eventually fill in the center pieces of the puzzle so that you have the full picture and understanding of what is ham radio. Now, if you're looking for a technical presentation, well, this is not the place for you. So why don't you go ahead and turn around and look for something else. However, if you have no electrical background, no engineering background, no exposure to ham radio or limited exposure to ham radio, just like myself, and you don't want to know the hows and the whys at this time, but you want a simple, complete background of ham radio, and you don't want to get it from multiple sources, you want a one-stop shop, then continue on and hit the simple button, or better yet, hit the subscribe button and the like button. So what exactly is ham radio? Well, it's radio frequencies allocated by the Federal Communication Commission, the FCC, for use by ham radio operators once they pass an examination. These radio frequencies are known as the amateur bands, and by law, you cannot operate on these frequencies without a license. The amateur bands are divided into three license classifications. Each license classification gives you legal access to operate on those certain frequencies. However, if you ask a more veteran seasoned ham radio operator, they may say it's a licensed radio service at the local, regional, and national level. Why? Because it often provides emergency assistance in times of natural disasters like hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, fires, as well as any other unforeseen disaster. No electrical power means no cell service, which means ultimately no communications. And this is where ham radio comes into play because they can operate on backup generators, solar power, and battery backup modes. Groups like Aries, Racy's, as well as local ham radio clubs practice with the emergency management coordinators in order to be able to lend a hand in a time of need. It's also a fast growing recreational hobby for both those who like to build or modify their equipment, as well as someone more like myself who just wants to use their equipment and the skill to use it to connect with people all over the world. There is a competitive side to ham radio, and this is called contesting. This is where a ham radio operator 
is challenged to reach as many other ham radio operators over a given period of time. Awards are handed out, certificates are proudly displayed in the ham radio community. A group that you must become familiar with is the ARRL, or the Amateur Radio Relay League, founded in 1914, which shows you ham radio goes back a long time. They represent us, the ham radio community, to the FCC and other key congressional committees in Washington, D.C. They also monitor the compliance of the bands, making sure that you're using the right band based on your license classification. They provide training. They do the license certifications as well as provide ongoing education to the ham radio community and so much more. Currently today, there are 790,000 licensed U.S. ham radio operators. In the world, 3.1 million. When you look at ham radio, there's different modes to operate in. Phone, what ham radio community calls it, is known to you and I as voice, someone talking. CW is Morse code, data, texting, and much more. And remember this, license classification equals access to frequencies. No one owns a frequency. It's open season. If you hear two people on a particular frequency, choose another frequency. Or if you want, you can just listen in because there is no privacy. Everyone can hear what you are talking about when it comes to ham radio. So what drew me into ham radio? Well, it was the realization that the power grid is not as reliable as I thought it was. After experiencing a number of hurricanes coming through North Carolina and watching the power go down quite often in other parts of the South and witnessing what happened in Texas with that cold snap, and it basically came within, they said, minutes or seconds of the whole grid collapsing. Now throw in hackers, and after watching what they did to the Colonial Pipeline, took it offline, and we had gas lines here, I had to ask myself, if the power grid went down, how would I communicate? Now, I originally started with shortwave radio, which was a great way of knowing what was going on around me, but I was never communicating with others of what was going on around me. Ham radio offers some unique benefits in the sense that there are a lot of power options to the equipment that can keep you up and running despite no power. For a handheld device, a lot of these batteries, if they're fully charged and you use them judiciously, they can last you days, weeks. If you have a mobile unit that's in your car, you can, again, go weeks, months. But a better system, and recently what I invested in is a battery backup box. It's portable, about the size of a toolbox. And if you connect it to a solar panel, for example, right here, you have unlimited access to power, which means you're going to be on 24-7 indefinitely until the power grid comes back on. Well, hopefully. So there's a certain number of people out there that just want to start out with listening to ham radio. And more than just ham radio, it's shortwave. It's uh, the emergency bands, uh, weather, air traffic, marine bands. There are options. You can start out with a very nice high-end radio like the Eaton that offers all of this. You can have portable options that are out there that are lower cost, but still good quality, access many, many of those bands. Or better yet, there are companies that are out there that are turning your PC into a ham radio listening device. How do they do that? They use a device, for example, by one company. It's called SDR Play, about the size of a wallet. Uh, portable antenna, doesn't cost much, connects into here, download their software, and now you can do all of this, the shortwave, HF bands, single sideband, emergency bands, weather bands, air traffic bands, marine bands, uh, the, the, the marching band, well, maybe not the marching band, but anyhow, you can get all of these bands as well as the additional plugins that offer so many other functions and features. You can do a whole video just on this type of application. So if you're looking to receive only, it's a great option and no license required. So what are the three equipment classifications when it comes to ham radio? Well, one is handheld devices or HT, you'll hear handy talkie. Two is a mobile device that can also act, in, in my case it is, as a base station, which means I have it up in my shack or my place where I actually do ham radio. I can take it out on a moment notice and attach it in my car. That's all discussion on how you do that. Uh, or if you're looking at the HF frequencies, your high frequencies, most people have base station units. They're not necessarily so portable. 
Now, when you hear the term transceiver, it basically means you can transmit and receive on the same device, which essentially is another term for ham radio. Now, there are three license classifications. The FCC will issue a license exactly like this without, you know, the names of whoever this is on here, but in your name, you'll get this. And it's typically mailed to you, emailed to you within 24 to 48 hours after passing examination. Now, what are the three classifications? You have your technician, your general, and your extra. Each of them get progressively more difficult as you go along, but each one enables you to have greater access to the frequency bands in those so-called amateur bands licensed by the FCC. Now, when you get this official copy emailed to you, and again, note you may want to check your spam filter because it was in mine, you're going to get a an FCC issued call sign to you. You don't get to pick it, they give it to you. If you don't like it, like I didn't like this one, I can use the vanity call sign application that they have out there. I did my research on finding out uh, what signs that I thought I would want, call signs I want, are they available, are they being used, etc. And I listed like six of them, and this happened to be my top one. And from my research, no one was currently using it. About three weeks later, I get another email congratulating me with my new call sign. So there are ways to change your call sign. And I would recommend if you don't like it, do it right in the beginning because it's harder down the road to do it because more people will associate you with that other call sign. So if we look at the number of ham radio operators today, 51% have their technician's license. 40% have their general license. 19% have their extra license. When you're going to take your test for both the technician and the general, expect 35 questions. You're going to need to pass 74%, which means you can miss nine. Now, when you get your technician's license, you get unlimited band access on the UHF, VHF bands. And I'll get into that specifically, what those are. You'll get to six meters, full access, 10 meters, single sideband only. The general one allows you to get into the HF market, your high frequency bands, that's your long distance bands. And that's why many people will go for their general license because this is where the long distance magic takes place within ham radio. Now, if, for, if you're really ambitious and you wanna get your extra, it's a lot more difficult. It's 50 questions. It's gonna also, again, require you to pass 74%, which means you could miss 13 but it gives you full access to all the bands and all the modes. Now, you can also volunteer and serve in certain programs for like those who administer your test. If you notice those people who take time out of their busy schedule to help you, uh, say thank you because they're not getting paid to do that. And those are the people who basically have their extra license. So let's look at some few key terms that you really need to understand. Let, let's call this Ham Radio 101 terminology. Radio waves, electromagnetic waves. Now, electromagnetic waves move through the atmosphere are impacted by certain atmospheric conditions. And things such as thunderstorms uh, are gonna have a negative impact. Solar flares are gonna have a positive impact because it's going to uh, charge the ionosphere. And that is what allows for longer distance communications. So these electromagnetic waves impacted by atmospheric conditions is basically when you hear the term propagate or propagation. Now, radio waves are gonna have a specific frequency and wavelength. And so if we look at frequency, and essentially frequency is the number of complete cycles of waves passing a point in unit time. And I'll show you a picture of this. So to me, when I look at this, it doesn't mean anything to me, but when you see the picture, it's like, aha, I get it. So there are a lot of frequencies that are out there. We're not concerned about these. We're concerned about these. Your HF, VHF, UHF, and in particular for the first two videos, your very high frequency, your VHF, and they operate between 30 and 300 megahertz, which is your two meter to six meter bands. Your UHF, your ultra high frequency, operates from the 300 to 3000 megahertz, and those are your 70 centimeters to your 23 centimeter bands. So again, let's keep building off of this. If we look at the bands, and bands are basically radio frequencies grouped together. So if we look at the UHF bands, what are they? Well, as far as ham radio is concerned, there's more bands that can fall into that UH uh, classification. But without throwing so many of them out there and confusing you, 
just focus on the fact that the UHF band is a 70 centimeter. The VHF bands are the 1.25 meters, 2 meters, and 6 meters. However, the 6 meters really is, by equipment standards, falls over into the HF bands, though it is not an HF band. So when we look at the HF bands, it's really 10 meters to 80 meters. And again, based on equipment, they're going to include the 160 meters, which is actually your middle frequency. So not to be confusing, think of UHF bands, 70 centimeter. Your VHF bands, think of it as 1.25 and 2 meters. Think of your HF bands, 10 meters, actually 6 meters to 160. So how did I know all of this? Well, the ARRL provides a band chart. Now, if you look at this, you're going to do what I did and says, ah, uh, what? I didn't know what this is. It's confusing at first, <clears throat> but in time you can figure it out. So if I look here by technician class, anything that says a T here, technician, general, and extra. Some of these classifications are older. They're no longer applicable. You know, advanced, you don't see that. You don't see uh, novice anymore. It's just basically three classifications that I just mentioned. So I can look at my classification. I can look at, okay, phone, which means voice. That's anything in green. And I can look at red, which is data. Now, here's the 10 meter. The 10 meter for a technician is going to allow that um, single sideband here, and that is on the frequency 28.300 megahertz to 28.500 megahertz. So pay attention if you're looking at this. This is basically the frequency, and it's going to go from one point to another point. So make it simple. This is all you need to focus on right now. 70 centimeter, 1.25 meter, 2 meter. When you get your HF, you can worry more about it. Let's just keep this simple. So again, a few key terms you must know. Remember, we talked about frequency, the number of waves that pass a fixed point in a given amount of time. Now, there is a higher frequency, and the higher frequency is going to have is going to be shortening the wavelength. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. The lower the frequency, the longer the wavelength. And what is a wavelength? It's the distance between two successive points in a wave. Now, you're probably saying, I still don't get it. The picture will make it all simple for you. You're going to hear the term hertz. It's the base unit to measure frequency. So just like you can say a gallon, an inch, hertz is a base unit of measurement. So that's something you're going to have to know. And one cycle per second equals one hertz. So let's make this all clear. If we looked at what is known as an oscilloscope, we've all seen these kinds of some kind of a TV show or old science fiction movie, whatever. And you're seeing these wave patterns just kind of going up and down, up and down. So it's a wave pattern. Well, if we look at a peak to peak, this is one cycle, one point here. Okay. One to one. So it completes a cycle. That's a cycle. And the wavelength is measured from this point to this point. Now, why, why does all this matter? If I have a higher frequency, it's going to compress these waves, and I'm going to have a shorter wavelength. If I have a lower frequency, it's going to spread them out. I'm going to have a longer wavelength. So let's look, for example, if I'm looking at a 3.7 megahertz or 80 meters, which is a lower frequency, and I have now 144 megahertz, that's a higher frequency, you can see that the impact on the wave distance, the length right here, is going to be directly related to the frequency. Higher the frequency, the shorter. The lower the frequency, the more it spreads out. So now let's look at it here. 3.7 megahertz is going to give me an 80 meter band. 144 megahertz is going to give me a 2 meter band. You're still confused? Well, let's clear this all up. <clears throat> The higher the frequency number, the lower the band will be. And this is important because what's really confusing is you would think 144 megahertz would be a higher band number. It's just the opposite. Two meters equals 144 megahertz. 160 meters is 1.8 megahertz. It took me a while to get my brain wrapped around this, that when you see the higher the frequency, it's a different band number. It's a lower band number. So... Uh, a lower frequency is going to be a higher band number. Hopefully this begins to make sense to you. 
again, we talk about bands and frequency ranges. When you think of your HF, your VHF, and your UHF, think of your HF or your high frequency as your long distance uh, frequencies, and your bands are going to reflect that. So this is where you want to operate long distance. It's the HF. Local to regional, VHF. UHF is more local. Now, this is generally speaking, again, because we remember when we talked about atmospheric conditions, well, if you have the right atmospheric conditions, and I'll explain that uh, later on, you can take one of these signals here, and instead of going, you know, 25, 35, 40 miles, how about 300 miles? So propagation does impact even these particular uh, frequencies and bands. Another thing you have to understand is we talked about the base unit. Remember hertz? Well, you're going to hear it measured in kilohertz, megahertz, and gigahertz. Well, what is the difference? A, a kilohertz is a thousand times more than a hertz. A megahertz is a thousand times more than a kilohertz. And a gigahertz is a thousand times more than a megahertz. That's the difference. So hopefully the light's going to go on. And you're going to see, you could take ham radio and put it into group one and group two. Well, you can do it by license classification. Group one are those who get their technician's license. Group two gets access to the HF now in addition to the UHF, VHF, but, but mostly also by equipment. Most equipment manufacturers out there in the UHF, VHF have specific radios that are only for UHF, VHF. Likewise can be said for those who are operating on the HF or your high frequency, your long distance bands. Now, always there's exceptions to our rules. And in the exception to this particular rule is that there are manufacturers who are making equipment, they call it basically multi-band or all-band radios that operate both of them together. But there are a small percent of all the options out there. So still, think of it as two groups based on equipment and license classification. So let's eliminate some more confusion that's out there. People will use certain terminology to say the same thing, but you may not understand that. I can remember the first time someone said, oh, I was on the 440 band today. And I'm going, I thought it was a 70 centimeter band. I don't get this. This is actually, they're, they're referring to the megahertz and they shorten it and basically to saying the 70 centimeter frequency ranges, they're going to call it the 440. And the two meter frequency range, they're going to call it the 144. When, when you're looking at the 70 centimeter and the two meter, think of it as the dual band. These two are the dual band. Now, there are some equipment manufacturers that are include the 220, which is the range for, for the 1.25 meter. And if they include this all together in their equipment, they're going to call it the tri-band. So dual band, these two, tri-band, these three. Now, let's see how this kind of plays out and how some of this terminology can be used differently but mean the same thing. So if I'm looking, for example, at a vertical base antenna, uh, dual band, and they're going to say two meter, 70 centimeter bands. Whereas if I'm looking at one of the handheld transceivers, they're going to say FM signal transmit coverage is 144 to 148 megahertz and the 420 to 450 megahertz. Well, we know this is the two meter and the 70 centimeter. So you're just going to have to be aware. They can either say it in terms of megahertz, in terms of the band, or in this particular case, they'll give it a generic name for the whole band in megahertz. So can be confusing, but hopefully knowing this now, it won't be. When we look at HF, as we mentioned earlier, you know, really the HF frequencies fall between the 10 meter and the 80, 80 meter. However, equipment manufacturers include the six meter VHF, 160 meter, which is the MF or middle frequency. So again, they're gonna call it HF, but we now know that only 95% of it is. So when we look at the different pieces of equipment to operate out there, and what can you expect to pay? So for a handheld or you know, HT, it can start as low as $50, like a simple Bofang radio, go up to $700 for a Kenwood. If you look at a mobile a slash base home unit, they can go from anywhere from $160 to $660. However, if you bring it into your home, since this operates off of a 12 volt battery, you're going to need what is known as like a power converter, or they call it a power supply. It's taking your wall current, 120 volts of AC, to 13.8 volts of DC, of direct current. In other words, think of it as they're making it so it acts like a battery voltage. 
Uh, cost on this particular radio was about $140, but you can expect anywhere from 110 to 500, depending on the whistles and bells and how much power and how many units you want to uh, power off of this. Because right now, this is basically for a single unit, uh, one at a time. But if you have multiple radios you want to operate at the same time, then that's why the price goes up. You're going to also be required to get a magnetic car mount antenna if you're using it in a mobile environment. You can expect to pay $50 to $250. Now, I want you to notice here, this is 50 watts of power. These are 3 to 8 watts of power. This means a lot further coverage that you're going to be able to transmit your signal versus here, 3 to 8, you know, if you're downtown in a, uh, with a lot of obstructions, buildings and stuff, you may get a mile, two miles. However, if you're out in the country, you may be able to get 30 miles, best case scenario. Whereas when you have a mobile unit, you're going to find your coverage far exceeds what you're getting with a handheld. Now, if you also take this like I did and make it my base station, you're going to want to uh, erect an additional antenna outside specifically for that radio. So I have my car mount that goes with my car. When I take it back into my house, I use a base station antenna uh, anywhere from $70 to $380. Now, when we look at some key terms, it's important to note it can be very, very confusing when you're talking analog digital. An analog signal uses FM waves for transmission, whereas a digital signal can take that analog that you're speaking into, it's going to convert it to digital, which is essentially a strings of O's and 1's, send it out, and when it comes into another radio, it's going to receive it as a digital signal and then convert it back to an analog, and you can hear it. Whereas an analog just strictly uses, uh, you know, an FM signal the whole time. Now, there are differences between the two of them. Analog upside, easier to use, easier to understand, and it's more quick to learn how to operate. They provide longer communication ranges. You can work with a weak signal, whereas digital, if it's a weak signal, it just drops off. But you can only have one conversation on one channel at a time. Digital can offer two signals operating. So what does that mean? It means more people could be using, for example, a repeater or talking on that same channel at the same time. So instead of, uh, think of a, of a one-party system, now it's basically divided into two. Two people having their own conversations separately. It also provides digital capabilities like texting, imaging, sending pictures, etc. It's really nice to have that. You're going to get a much stronger signal, and the result of that stronger signal is a longer battery life. Again, as I mentioned, with digital... If the signal gets weak, it can, be get, it can be impacted by atmospheric conditions, which makes it weak, essentially you're going to lose it. So understand either you have the signal or you don't have the signal. It's not like I can work with a weak signal. Now, another term you can hear is DMR, and that is a digital mobile radio. That is a, a mobile radio operating in a specific digital format. And that format is known as the European Develop Open Standard Format. Uh, it's very popular in the United States on the commercial end of it, becoming more popular now in ham radio. Um, again, we talked about con it converts your signal from a digital and sends it out as an RF signal. Now, companies such as Bridgetone, or excuse me, Bridgecom, Anytone, their DMR radios use this open standard, and they're really growing. They're pretty much a disruptor in the marketplace. Uh, it does require to registering it, it have a, a digital ID for the radio uh, based off of your call sign. But this is a great radio based on the uh, advantages you get up here from a digital signal. Now, you're going to see the other players, and we'll get more into who these guys are and what products that they offer. But major players in the market in ham radio today are ICOM and Yesu, and, and Kenwood is, I call, fading. But these two right here own a lot of the ham radio market. And they actually do digital, but they don't use the open standard. So they basically offer an analog radio that does digital, but it's based on their specific protocols, which means if you have an ICOM radio, you have to use the ICOM D-Star system. If you use the Yesu radio, you have to use the System Fusion system. So very specific on how they do digital versus when you look at the Anytone, they use the open standard, but then it's called a digital mobile radio when you use the Anytone uh, type of radio. So now the newer radios are going to operate both in analog and digital. So I can have an analog radio that does digital, but if it's from ICOM, it does it the way ICOM wants you to do it or Yesu's way of doing it. If I have an, a digital radio 
that comes from example right here with the Bridgecom Anytome, it does digital, pure digital. However, it can still operate in an analog mode so it can hit the analog repeaters. And again, I'll get into this, but understand there is a difference between analog digital and really who operates in a digital mobile radio. So who are these manufacturers I've been talking about? Well, you have Icon, for example. Icon in, uh, is a Japanese-based company. Yesu is a Japanese-based company. Fierce competitors, great companies as far as products that they offer, services and, and features for their radio, just amazing. Uh, they own the market for the, for the most part. Um, you'll see most people wanting to get uh, to these radios eventually. They won't start out with them, maybe, but that's where the, you really want to go to. Now, Kenwood is another uh, Japanese company, been in the market a long time, superior quality products, but do not really have a commitment to the lower end spectrum pricing. And especially on the UHF, VHF, they have one radio that they have out there, and that's the one that's like $750. Their real focus is on the, your HF frequencies, your high frequencies, and more at the top end. Uh, however, their equipment is outstanding. It's one of those, it's basically kind of like a gold standard. When you use Kenwood, it's the best, but maybe not uh, as many choices that you're going to get. Now, as I mentioned, Bridgecom is the disruptor in the marketplace. With their digital mobile radios, uh, more people are gravitating to those uh, for the UHF, VHF bands. So keep an eye on them. Now, Alinko was a Japanese uh, manufacturer uh, company. However, they were bought recently by the Chinese, and we don't know exactly what the quality standards are anymore because manufacturing is more or less going over to China. Historically, have been a great radio, considered a mid to high range radio, but a question mark on the future. Now, there are other radios out there like Bofang and TYT and other ones. Um, but like, for example, Bofang is a, I call it, it's a low end introduction ham radio. If you don't have much money, you want to get on, use it. It's a great radio, but it's not one of those radios like these that you'll keep a lifetime. So be aware just real quickly on these radios that come with a good antenna but serious users will replace them because they realize with a better quality antenna, they can get a longer range and that can make the difference whether or not you get your signal reached uh, to another radio or to a repeater. And most of them don't include many accessories, so factor that into your cost. Again, I mentioned the term repeater and I'm gonna show you a picture here and it'll make more sense, just like we did with the radio waves. You can actually see what that means. So a repeater is a device that's gonna take your weak FM signal and it's going to amplify and boost it, and it's going to retransmit it to a much larger ge geographical area. So let's say I'm in downtown Raleigh, and all the buildings are blocking my signal from being able to go very far. But there happens to be a repeater, which there are in downtown Raleigh, that if I can reach that repeater in downtown Raleigh, it's going to take my limitation of a couple miles, and now maybe send it out 25 miles or, or, or farther. So it really makes a big difference. That's why repeaters are used the majority of time on the UHF, VHF band, because it can take that weak signal and push it out much farther. And we'll get much more in depth on this in here in a few slides. Now you can link these repeaters together, essentially giving you instead of maybe a 25 to 40 mile range, you can double it. Or if, if you go link repeaters that are further apart, now you basically cover even a larger dif uh, distance. There are some groups out there that will link repeaters together that are multi-states. And so I'm using my local repeater and I'm now talking to people in other states. We'll, again, I'll break that out here in a little bit. Just be aware, the term gateway is a computer device at the repeater. And it's usually at the same location, it's right next to it. And it allows now to be able to take that signal instead of rebroadcasting it out, your signal rebroadcasting it out further it's gonna take it through a gateway computer and that's gonna send it through the internet. And we're, we're gonna go with that here in a few slides. What does that mean and what does it look like? So what you need to understand is there are multiple ways you can use your ham radio in the UHF, VHF space. I can do what is known as a simplex call. And essentially that's a direct point to point. Think of it as two people talking on a walkie talkie, very similar, predicated upon uh, the topography if, it's, if I'm on two mountaintops and I have two good radios, 64 miles. If I'm in the uh, downtown Raleigh with a bunch of buildings, a mile to two miles, and then it falls anywhere in between based on hills, trees, buildings, whatever, all that stuff impacts your signal. 
Now, a repeater, this is where you're going to be spending the majority of your time. You want to hit a repeater, you want to reach a repeater, and then you want them to rebroadcast your signal, okay? Now, gateways is when you want to go past that repeater and connect to others all around the world in what are known as chat rooms. And again, I'll break that down more later. Now, when you're operating on the simplex frequencies, they are limited. There's national simplex frequencies as well as state simplex fre frequencies. So you need to make sure that you operate a simplex calls on specific simplex frequencies. And these are the ones. Now, when we talk about repeaters and gateways, let's give you a picture. Let's give you an image. What does a repeater look like? Well, if you could picture these really funky looking antennas on top of buildings, on top of water towers, on top of mountains or hills, anywhere, high points, basically high points. If your radio can reach one of those antennas, there's going to be a location right near it. There's going to be some computer equipment that's going to take that signal and it could put it into the repeater hardware. And on that hardware is also software that can take it, amplify it and boost it and send it back out. Or if there happens to be a gateway, remember, that's a separate piece of hardware software that's specifically designed to connect to the repeater and to take that signal from that repeater, now move it into the gateway, and I'm not going to go in exactly how it does right now. Again, high level, very simple, keep it simple. Now it allows it to send it out through the internet, and it can be then picked up at another location anywhere in the world. Now, when you have a repeater connected to a gateway, it's called a node. Again, this, this is important. A repeater connected to a gateway is called a node. Now, who owns these repeaters? Most of them are privately owned. Uh, amateur radio clubs, uh, individuals that are uh, very uh, enthusiastic, enthusiastic about ham radio will provide it for themselves, and it's expensive. These are not cheap to keep up and running. They're open to all for the most part. There are some ones that are private to clubs only. Uh, members only can use them. But by far, most of those are open to anyone, provided you don't abuse it. In the ham radio world, you're going to be looking at the 2 meter, the 1.25 meter, and the 70 centimeter. Now, there are other repeaters that cover, you know, the, the 23 centimeter and other type of bands, the 33 centimeter. But those are more on the commercial market side. But for ham radio, think 2 meter, 1.25 meter, and 70 centimeter. How do you know where they are? Two ways. You can go to repeaterbook.com, which I'll get into that in more depth here, or the ARRL offers a repeater book that you can buy. This is free. Now, there are things called nets and directed nets. And it's important to know because you will be participating in them. It's more or, or less to the directed nets. But what is a net? A net is essentially ham radio operators meeting on a specific time, specific frequency, specific day, Friday night, 7 o'clock on 147.125, uh, hitting their local repeater. And they're all able to talk and practice their ham radio skills and just have what is known as a QSO. They can talk. Now, a directed net, same concept, but much more formal. There are strict protocols that operate when you're doing a directed net. You're going to hear the term net operator. They are basically the, the facilitator. This is open to anyone who wants to participate it, and they actually encourage and love to have more people uh, get onto these nets. This is where you get to practice your ham radio skills and use your equipment. But before you would actually participate or talk on one, I would strongly recommend to listen one or two times, get used to how the, the practice is set up. Now, don't worry about failing and making a mistake because as soon as you tell these people, hey, I just got my ham radio license, they will bend over backwards and they're going to help you. They'll educate you, inform you on how to do it properly. And you're going to have a lot more fun because don't worry about failing because they're there to help you become successful. Now, as I mentioned, a QSO is basically a conversation between ham radio operators. Now, when we talk about local repeaters, they serve multiple functions. One function is strictly for individuals to talk one another. If there's not a net uh, specific meeting scheduled, it's open to anyone who's in access to that repeater to hit it. Now, I can uh, talk to somebody who I hear on it, or in more cases or not, it goes back to uh, calling out your call sign, for example, and say, hey, 
this is uh, KO4 TWA listening or KO4 TWA mobile. And if someone's out there listening, they want to have a conversation, they'll pick it up. So it's a great way of being able to talk to people, local area, off a local repeater. Now, you'll find what are known as these directed nets meeting, uh, usually in the evenings for the most part. And this is a, a great way for clubs to be able to leverage these nets that, or excuse me, these uh, repeaters that are out there for their net meetings. And as I had mentioned, there's multiple ways to talk. You may hear people going CQ, 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 and they'll, that's essentially a call sign to say, hey, anyone out there uh, want to talk to me? But more or less, I don't hear that so much on local nets anymore. That's more on your HF, but that's just my two cents. So let's look and see how it works. Here I am, KO4 TWA. I'm at Wake Forest on my Icon 5100. I'm going to hit a local repeater, uh, whether it is a 2-meter or a 70-centimeter. I'll hit one of the repeaters. Uh, again, there's more to hitting a repeater. There's a whole separate video I'll be doing on how to program your radio uh, to make sure that you can have access to that repeater because it's just not, you know, just uh, putting 441.725 on your ham radio and, you know, uh, transmitting to it. It doesn't work like that. But as soon as I'm able to get through it, once my radio is programmed, I can connect and talk to others, as well as other repeaters if they're linked. So, again, we're going to have to take a, a separate video on how to program your radio and where do you get that information to put in so that you can access specific repeaters. So we talked about uh, single repeaters. There's linked repeaters. Quickly take you through this. Colin is trying to get a hold of his uh, California buddy, Rufus. Well, if Rufus is in town, he's hitting in the car and counts from a home on his base unit, he wants to reach out to him, they can both hit the local repeater. Now, if the repeaters are linked, that means someone like Katie, who could be at a link repeater that's another 50 miles away, and she's 25 miles further uh, west of that repeater, she can all of a sudden get into this conversation because the repeaters are linked. So Colin wants to talk to Katie, but you know what? Since Rufus is already talking or listening, he can be part of the conversation as well. So link repeaters basically means instead of two repeaters, they are considered now one repeater in the sense that as a repeater works, if, if Colin and Rufus are talking, no one else can talk. They basically you want to say secure or lock up the repeater. When you link repeaters, both those repeaters are now secured or locked up. So how do they know uh, where to find these repeaters? Well, I mentioned repeater, repeaterbook.com. And this is where you're going to want to go to. You can look up my state, for example. I can look at by bands. I'm going to look for specifically where are my two meters or my 70 centimeters. Um, I can look at which ones are linked. I use the 440 Carolina linking system. And again, I'll break this out in more detail in the next video. So if you understand what I basically just told you, you pretty much can operate ham radio in the UHF, VHF bands very successfully. So you can sit back, relax, get your license, go ahead and use it, learn how to use repeaters. At that point, you're done. Unless you want to go to the next level and get to uh, go through those gateways through the internet and start re reaching these chat rooms all throughout the world. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on in the next section. So a quick summary here. Uh, remember, there are two groups. Think of your UHF, VHF classification uh, within ham radio and your high frequencies. And again, license class is determined by what test you pass. If you, you have a technician's license, you get UHF, VHF. General, you're going to add the HF. Repeaters, where you're going to talk 95% of the time. So we're going to have to learn how to get you up and running on a repeater. And again, when we're doing digital voice, you have to look at the manufacturer and how they do it. You know, the Bridgecom Anytome uses a DMR radio, whereas ICOM Yesu uses digital voice, but through their own protocols. And again, make sure you know where your repeaters are before buying any of your devices, because if you're really far from a repeater and you buy a piece of equipment, if you can't access it, then what are you going to do? So upcoming videos, I got a number of them. Part two should be released here shortly. Uh, HF will follow. Then I'll do shorter, deeper dives. Uh, on how to get your license and then pro uh, learning how to program the repeaters as well as nets and clubs. You're going to have to join that right away. Otherwise, you'll, again, you'll just fall away from ham radio if you don't get engaged in using your equipment with others. And that's how you do that. Uh, talked about uh, antennas, some cool technology that's out there. So 
If you like what you see and have heard, please hit the subscribe button, and I would greatly appreciate it if you'd hit the like button. Hey, this is MJ, call sign KO4TWA, out.